everyone to our first sustainability snapshot session. So for context, these are lightning round talks with the goal to flip the script from broader industry level panels to more intimate individual reflections around what it means to create sustainable change. We'll be joined by four climate pioneers throughout the day who will share a green take on the change we need in our system. They'll share the surprising ways that responding to the climate alarm clock has changed their daily work in education, in wine, in chocolate, and in fashion. First up, we have Jason Jacobs, who is the host of one of my favorite podcasts, a popular climate education podcast called My Climate Journey. Jason is a longtime entrepreneur, most recently as the founder and CEO of Runkeeper, which was acquired um, by ASICS in 2016. In 2018, he started building the My Climate Journey platform, which now consists of a podcast, a vibrant, active member community, and a fund focused on helping address the problem of climate change through content, community, and capital. Jason, it's my pleasure to hand it over to you. Uh, thanks, Joanna. It, it, it's a great honor to be here today. Uh, it, it's also pretty intimidating because two and a half years ago, I was deeply concerned about climate change, but I didn't know anything. And so the fact that I'm speaking at a prestigious climate conference like this is pretty ironic, to be honest with you. But uh, at any rate, I am not equipped to speak with you about from a position of being an expert of any sort. Uh, I thought about what would be most helpful, and I, I figured the thing that would be most valuable is just for the people that are attending, that are not experts, that are deeply concerned about the problem, where do you start? What do you do? Uh, I get that question a lot, so uh, maybe I'll just share a bit about my story in case it's helpful for some of you who are thinking about it. Uh, so I'm a longtime entrepreneur, but this is, the climate is kind of my third act. Uh, my a uh, first phase out of undergrad was working in small high growth technology companies in functional roles of increasing responsibility. Uh, but these were infrastructure companies selling software to big banks and health systems. And I really loved the sport of business and the people I worked with and serving customers well, but I wasn't really passionate about the widget. And I didn't really think that that mattered. I always planned on being an entrepreneur. And when I set out to try to build a company, once I started feeling more ready, I couldn't find anyone that felt right. And I didn't know why. I was starting to have self-doubt and started training for a marathon. And it, I, I uncovered an idea to build a big fitness technology company. It was only in hindsight that I realized that actually the widget did matter. So Runkeeper, which is the fitness, digital fitness app and community that I built uh, along with the team over almost a decade, that was the first company I'd worked in where I really cared deeply about the domain. Uh, so that company we raised close to $20 million in equity financing, plus a little bit of debt. We had a, a bumpy ride. It took a lot out of me that I may never get back. But, uh, but in the end, we had uh, a really good outcome. And uh, we were acquired by ASICS, a shoe company. I ran digital there for a couple of years. Uh, I left, took some time off to like start to piece myself back together because uh, that was a bumpy ride. And um, I had this wave of survivor guilt. I was like, man, like I was so, there's so many things that had to all come together for that outcome to happen. And if any one of those a thousand things hadn't come together just that way, it wouldn't have happened. And I didn't feel worthy. I was almost embarrassed that, uh, that, we, that we had the outcome that, that we did. And I wanted to devote my next chapter to purpose. I was deeply concerned about climate. So it was one of the first areas I looked at, but initially I just didn't get it. I was like, I don't really understand this area. Uh, I don't know the best ways to address it. I don't know how my skills uh, can, can be applied. Um, and, uh, and it seems like it might be depressing uh, as I'm sure some of you can, can relate to as well. I mean, it's scary stuff. So I talked myself into building another consumer company and I put three VCs on the cap table from day zero, just had a market, not even really a company, just was like a entrepreneur in residence selling a little bit of equity kind of thing. Got the team back together from Runkeeper and had all these different areas we were looking at. And, I, but you know, my two co-founders were just ready to go build in any one of these areas. And I just couldn't do it because it was literally during this time that the IPCC report came out, the one and a half degree report. Trump took steps to withdraw us from the Paris Agreement. The symptoms of climate change were becoming more and more visible and obvious. 
the scientific community was foaming at the mouth, no one was listening. Uh, so increasingly my co-founders were getting impatient that, you know, that we had all these fertile areas to go and attack and I wasn't green lighting anything. And increasingly I was getting impatient because all I wanted to do was go walk in the woods. And I was like, I thought I was going to work on something purposeful in my next chapter. And now, you know, we're looking at all these vapid consumer things. So in December of 2018, I still had almost all the little bit of institutional capital that we had raised. I had more than 90% of it left. I returned it uh, to those uh, venture capital firms and came back into climate with all the same concerns about uh, how I would help, but a lot more determined to figure it out. So what I did, uh, and I guess that was the long-winded version of finally getting to the point that maybe some of you care about, uh, but what I did was I said, okay, I'm going to put me aside, and I'm just going to start learning. So I started reading, started, to started talking to lots of people, and uh, as I did, those people who were experts, you know, who had been working in climate a long time, said consistently, they said, like, it's great to see the new blood coming in, keep me posted on your progress. So once a month, I started sending an email and just saying, Here's what I learned since last month. Here are the open questions I have. Here's what I'm trying to tackle next. And it was nice for me because it was some accountability. Uh, and it, I felt like I had almost like a little cheering section too, because it was a, a lonely journey. Uh, and um, that led to a virtuous cycle of more and more introductions. So I started talking to more and more experts. And then with their consent, I would add them to this uh, once a month email that I was sending out. And uh, a few months in, people started reaching out that were like me. Uh, they were people that were maybe working in other fields and who, uh, um, who were inspired by the journey I was heading out on and wanted to follow down a similar path and didn't know where to start. So I didn't have a great place to point them, but I said, I wish you could be a fly on the wall for all these great discussions I'm having. So I started a podcast essentially just to stick microphones in the hands of the people that I was already talking to. Uh, Alicia Seiger, who, who's on here, was actually an early guest on the show, and she was also very helpful introducing me to other people. So thank you, Alicia. Uh, but I, I essentially, the thought was just to build a knowledge repository for those that came after me. So a few months into recording these podcasts twice a week, my inbox started filling up with all these amazing people that were super engaged in the pod. They were uh, viewing it as an invaluable learning tool to help shortcut their own processes. Uh, they were really interesting, strategic people, and they came from really diverse places. So I knew about them. They didn't know about each other. I set up a Slack community just to stick them all in the same room. Like there was no master plan here. This was just kind of an organic process just by getting myself to like take the first step. Uh, and um, that community has now kind of ballooned into this vibrant place where there's over 1300 members. There's some modest dues associated with it just to like stop the bleeding and help us uh, uh, keep the lights on a little bit. Uh, and, um, and these are people, there's kind of four criteria we screen for in the community. It's like uh, determination to tackle the problem of climate change, ambition to work on the most impactful stuff, optimism that we're not wasting our time to try, and a collaborative spirit. But beyond that, the more diversity, the better. So we have people from all different sectors, all different functions, all different geographies, uh, but that share these common values. Uh, and there's so much good that's come out of that community. There's a number of founding teams that met in, the, in that Slack room. There's a number of nonprofits that were hatched in that Slack room that are now ongoing entities. There's a bunch of companies that have raised money, uh, funds that have gotten LPs in there, a ton of hiring that's gotten done. I get these inbound stories every week and keep in mind, like none of this was planned. Uh, and um, uh, at the same time for me, I just started writing small angel checks just as like another way to learn because startups are my passion, but I didn't know anything about these sectors. So if I found an, uh, a team that felt like they were the real deal and they were focused on a big area for decarbonization, and they had some smart institutional money either in there or coming alongside, I would just write a little check with the thought that it was almost like grad school tuition, which I'm sure many of you can relate to as well. Uh, so I did probably 15 of those over the course of about a year. And obviously that's a privileged position to be in to be able to write those checks to begin with. Um, but I was, and it was invaluable in, in helping my learning journey. I didn't view it as, I didn't wanna put the pressure on it of like a financial return. I also didn't want to set money on fire. So that's why I wanted to invest alongside smart institutional partners. But in some cases, like I didn't even see a deck. I mean, I just wanted to get closer to the action. And um, some of those companies started raising follow on. I started pulling together some SPVs because increasingly in the Slack community was a subset of the community that was highly liquid that like 
was clamoring to learn alongside me. Uh, so they wanted to just essentially play behind the hand of these small angel jacks I was making so they could benefit from that learning too. Um, and where, and then uh, just in the last um, few months during the pandemic, actually, that kind of spiraled into a fund. Uh, and so now we have this fund using Angelus new rolling fund structure and we're writing 100 to 250K checks in. Well, the number keeps growing as the capital grows that we have under management, but I mean, eight, nine, 10, 10 companies every quarter in climate tech, uh, small checks as part of these larger institutional rounds, just like I was doing as an angel across sectors, pre-seed, seed and A. Uh, and it's really exciting uh, because you know our content, there's like a portfolio of offerings that's growing. Our community, there's a bunch of kind of convening and events and programming and things that both members are doing for each other and, um, and that we're putting on for members over time. And then we have this kind of early entry fund that is like getting involved in a bunch of awesome climate tech companies. And as those companies do follow on, we have you know, later stage investors that are kind of eating out of our hands for deal flow, but directionally we wanna have later stage capital as well uh, as our machine scales. Uh, all that to say um, that, uh, you know, both from my experience and from the experience of so many people that are part of the little community that, uh, that I kind of accidentally manage, there's no script. Like if you're trying to think about getting into climate, uh, it doesn't matter if you start by reading this book or that book or listening to this podcast or taking this internship or doing this fellowship. The most important thing is just to start and give yourself permission to not have all the answers and to kind of step out into the unknown. If you're not in a financial position to do what I did, then uh, do it nice and weekends. Uh, or maybe take a job that gets you closer to it with the understanding that maybe it's not the perfect job, but it could then give you a step and inform and a the beginnings of a track record to then start building a bridge to where you ultimately want to go. Um, but it really doesn't matter where you start. It's kind of like just you kind of step out and start learning and then do more of what works and less of what doesn't. Uh, so that's a little bit about my story. You can learn more about what we're up to at myclimatejourney.co, but I also want to leave time for any questions. And I don't know how interactive we can be in this webinar format, but if you do have questions either now or afterwards, I'm just Jason at myclimatejourney.co, or I can field them here as well. That's it. Thank you, Jason. That was incredible. Um, and I hope shows a lot of folks that um, becoming educated and impactful in this space is accessible no matter where folks are, are at in their climate education journey. It's, it's really a matter of, of reaching out and, and jumping right in. Um, so if you have questions for Jason, please toss them in the Q&A. We'll have time at the end um, to do a couple audience questions. Next, though, I want to introduce John Williams, who is a winemaker and co-founder of Frog Sleep Winery. He studied fermentation sciences at Cornell University and enology and viticulture, I had to look those up, um, at UC Davis and quickly became an award-winning winemaker. In 94, he became the owner of Frog Sleep Winery in Napa and under his guidance, um, Frog Sleep has evolved as a really provocative model of a successful and sustainable family farm. He and his winery team have been widely recognized for their contributions to the organic farming movement, um, for their promotion of alternative energy sources and their ongoing efforts to encourage sustainable business practices. John, um, we're very excited to hear from you today on all things sustainable winemaking. So I will pass the floor over to you. <laughs> well, thank you for that lovely introduction. And, and Jason, wow, how inspiring. Uh, I, I look forward to connecting with your podcast. Well, here we are up in the Napa Valley, and I think uh, probably a lot of you have been here. You know it's one of the most beautiful places on earth to, uh, to visit, and I can tell you it's a great place to, to uh, live, to work, to farm, and to make what I might be a little biased, some of the finest wines in the world. Uh, but you know, our North Coast uh, wine growing regions have been much in the news lately with the wildfires sweep, sweeping through all of Northern California and kind of with our new normal of power shutoffs and crazy heat waves and high winds and atmospheric rivers, um, all this is making it clear that climate change is here and that uh, business is not as usual, even here in paradise. Uh, so climate change, uh, we can't say we weren't warned. A 2006 study uh, showed that 81% of premium wine grape acreage in California could be gone by the turn of the 21st century. And that was followed up by a 2011 Stanford report by the Wood Institute, asserting that uh, the North Coast land suitable for growing premium wine grapes could be reduced by 50% by the year 2040. That's not that far along. 
Uh, well, this captured headlines, as you can imagine, the LA Times, the Chronicle, even Decanter, the most widely read wine publication in the world, weighed in claiming uh, Napa will be unsuitable for premium wine grapes in the next 30 years. And that was 10 years ago. And then when 750 Daily, a domestic online uh, trading publication, proclaimed uh, about the slow boiling of the Napa frog, well, I took that one personally. And so um, uh, here we are. We now are faced with a lot of questions up here. And uh, maybe questions we weren't quite prepared for as simple farmers and winemakers. You know, what can we do in, in our industry to, uh, to slow the progress of climate change? What can we do perhaps to reverse uh, um, a warming climate? And then what are we going to uh, do to mitigate uh, what is obvious um, uh, change that is already here? Now you'll come to see I'm an eternal optimist. So first the good news, if you will, uh, we are farmers. And as farmers, we're in a unique position uh, to uh, aid in the sequestration of carbon in our plants and perhaps more importantly in our soils. So let's start where we started. At Frog's Leap, we realized years ago that to make great wine, we had to first grow great grapes. And, and we were amongst the first wineries in the state of California to seek organic certification for our vineyards. And we've been farming organically now for well, well over 30 years. Uh, the principle of organic farming is if you take from the soil, you must return to the soil in equal measure. The amazing thing is what we now know is that by building on this principle, we've actually been able to move beyond organic and with a little extra effort, we can return to the soil in greater measure, what we call regenerative uh, farming. When we restore uh, our, uh, when we use our in-house compost, when we uh, grow cover crops, uh, when we plant beneficial hedgerows, when we restore our riverbanks and riparian corridors, uh, all surrounding our vineyards, we're farming in a way that regenerates the land. And through these methods, we've been able to return and bank carbon uh, in the soil as organic matter. On the 200 acres we farm in Rutherford, we also practice dry farming, a traditional method of cultivating grapes without supplemental irrigation. This method uh, builds resilience in our grapevines and helps the plant navigate uh, changing conditions uh, more readily. And of course, it also means that we're not pulling thousands of gallons of water out of the aquifer only to drip it back onto the hot soil uh, a practice that gives up carbon and nitrous oxide, in particular, all greenhouse great gases. Uh, and uh, you know, so this is this is a, a, a something I think more people could be doing. In the early 2000s, we in installed solar. We were first lead certified building in the entire California wine industry. And in a sea of of uh, grapevines, we've consciously committed uh, to more than 10 percent of our agricultural land uh, to uh, more biodiverse alternative crops and native habitat, uh, which helps shade our soils, it reduces pest pressure, and it, of course uh, sequesters, again, stable amounts of carbon. And in our workforce, it cannot be uh, environmental justice without social justice. Uh, we made our, uh, a move to all full-time employment for all of our employees uh, along with livable wages. And uh, with that, we meet our, uh, our farm labor as well. In the cellar, we've uncovered opportunities to improve as well over the last few years uh, we've been working with a local manufacturer over in Sonoma to perfect concrete aging vessels um, with unlimited time spans, which has allowed us to reduce our barrel usage by 30% overall and cut down on, of course, the freight that it takes to get here from France. I mean, and it, just an aside, it takes us, it takes a 75 year old oak tree just to make two barrels. And uh, the average lifespan of these barrels in the Napa Valley is three to five years at most. And by the way, do we need that much oak in our wines anyway? Let's talk about packaging for a minute. Do you know, I think packaging is probably the singles, single biggest contributor to greenhouse gases in the production of wine. We were able to significantly reduce our carbon footprint by simply reducing the weight of our bottles. Um, but you know, you have to be careful with this. Uh, people equate these big heavy bottles with big Napa Cabernets and big prices and big points. And so marketing has to be part of this uh, discussion as well. But you know, all this isn't enough. We're not even close to making any uh, significant changes. And uh, climate change is, is a serious wake up call to be out in the fields uh, during harvest and uh, experience the lightning strikes that we had last year and violent wind gusts and uh, record numbers of days uh, of temperature over 105 degrees and historically low rainfalls. Uh, uh, we need to continue to challenge ourselves and ask what needs to be done. Uh, now, we've been kind of shooting in the dark, and uh, we just recently uh, jumped in with both feet, no pun intended, uh, to uh, definitively audit our greenhouse gas emissions. So we are now in the middle of an annual audit uh, to determine where we are expending uh, uh, carbon. 
Uh, and this is a very, very vigorous uh, proce process. I can tell you it's already inspiring us uh, to do things that we haven't done before. Uh, can we increase the biodiversity with ag agroforestry? Uh, can we uh, replace fossil fuels and farming? There's a, a new electric tractor to being developed in the, in the Silicon Valley right now. We hope to be one of the first uh, four operations to use one of these electric uh, tractors. Uh, can we capture the CO2 that's emitted during our fermenters uh, during um, uh, fermentation time? What, what about the business of wine? Can we use some marketing innovation so we're not traveling so much as kind of uh, an ancient way of selling wine? Uh, can we use the power of the consumer and to make meaningful change there? Can we explore areas of, uh, you know, of, uh, of business uh, that are in what we call compassionate uh, capitalism? Uh, we're, uh, uh, in a, we're researching becoming a B Corporation, for example. Honestly, I think someone who could contribute a, an honest profit and loss statement and an honest balance sheet would do a great uh, deal to contribute uh, to uh, measuring uh, these things. Uh, so we aim to quantify everything from our grape sources to our farming inputs to the number of plane trips and taxi rides on marketing trips and our waste production and everything in between, all, that hopes, all in hopes that we can be prepared, prepared to meet the challenges and pursue opportunities that are out there. I would guess that the, just the brain power on this webinar right now, we could come up with dozens of innovations that could collectively make a huge difference. And I say, let's do it. Uh, connect with that podcast or email me, john at frogsleep.com. Let's make something happen here. Listen, this is deeply personal. My family is rooted to this land the, and the wines we choose to grow and make here are deeply connected to this specific place. People have, have said, maybe we can move somewhere else uh, to make wine, but uh, might we be able to grow uh, Cabernet in Calgary? Perhaps, but only a fool would expect it to reflect the magical terroir of Rutherford. Um, you know, I wanna take a moment to acknowledge I there are many others in our community who are, are doing a number of really progressive wineries uh, and then several groups, including the Porto Protocols, the International Wineries for Climate Change, the Deep Roots Coalition, Wine Institute, Napa Valley Vintners, Napa Valley Grape Growers. We're all engaging in meaningful dialogue. And even though we may be competitors in some case, we're really joining to do. Imagine what we could do if we could enlist more farmers globally to reject the paradigm of, in, in, of input-based industrial farming and revitalize the old age old and well-tested me measures of regenerative organic farming. Not only would we have a healthier, more productive, more sustainable food system uh, that actually fully nourishes our populace, it's estimated that by returning carbon to our own nation's farmland in the form of organic matter, we could more than adequately sequester all the excess carbon in our atmosphere. It's way past time to retire the myth that we cannot sustain our nation using sustainable methods. It's not true and it's by definition self-defeating. Well, you know, I'm, uh, now that we're all fired up, I'm sad to say that it isn't enough. There's a lot more to do, but I don't have a lot more uh, time to talk. Uh, I want to um, invite you into my uh, website to read about uh, thinking like a grapevine because it is unlocking the power of nature that is gonna be one of our most powerful tools in fighting climate change. And I could talk to you all afternoon about this. It has changed my life um, to uh, engage with the ecosystem of the growing vine and, and to adopt the knowledge of these living sentient plants and, and this living ecosystem of the plants because all 12,236 of my grapevines, new climate change was coming a long time ago and they've already made many of the adaptations uh, that we need. I'll close by saying this, I'm not willing to believe that we cannot collectively find within ourselves the resolve to work together to reverse the worst uh, effects of uh, atmospheric poisoning. I seek the inspiration of the natural world around me, including all of you. And I invite you to come to Frog Sleep, uh, walk in our vineyards and orchards, uh, surrounded by healthy air and abundant life and be inspired by the natural world. And by the way, we'll have a glass of wine when you come up. Thank you very much. I love that, John. And I'm sure I will take you up on that offer at some point. Um, and I, I wanna save just a quick moment for a few audience questions before we wrap up. Um, so we'll kind of do a rapid fire round. Um, so for Jason, if you wanna join us back on screen um, from audience member, Dan B, how did you dig up the first experts to get started with my climate journey? And, and how did you get traction there? Uh, Google, I mean, I just started reading. And then if I read an article that was interesting and, and I, uh, 
and was someone quoted in the article that seemed like they knew what they were talking about, I would look up their background. And if their background seemed interesting, I would reach out and just say, you know, I'm a former entrepreneur. And maybe it helped because I had built a company and sold it and things like that in terms of credibility, but uh, I'm sure it did actually. But it doesn't mean that anyone else couldn't do it. Just reach out and say, you know, I'm X and I have climate on my mind and I'm at the front end of the journey. I'm trying to learn. I read the article and I, and I appreciate it for these reasons. And uh, if you could spare time either for a brief phone call or some questions back and forth on email, I would greatly appreciate it. And you, you're not going to bat a thousand, but who cares? Like, you know, if you just do that, whenever you see someone interesting, then, you know, the no's don't matter. It's just the yeses. And then once you start getting a few yeses, then it builds and you start building a peer group and building your knowledge and getting more credibility. And then, uh, it just kind of, it kind of builds on itself. I love that. Um, okay, John, over to you. What was the, the, most, um, the most difficult business decision you had to make in turning the winemaking process over to a more climate conscious practice of, of all the things that you shared today? Honestly, Joanna, they've come hand in hand. And, and I, I want to say this, it's so uh, inspiring to see how good business decisions and good ecological decisions and good uh, social decisions all seem to fit together. And this is the amazing thing. I actually think they power each other. And, um, and so I don't think this is a net, uh, 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 some game basically. Uh, this, these, all these powers are additive. And I think that uh, that's what's really exciting about them. Um, we, we make better wine by farming this way. We make a more stable business. I mean, I've turned 40 bucks in my pocket into $22 million in debt. I'm, I'm consider myself a really successful business person. And uh, these, <laughs> these ideas have been a powerful inspiration to them. So I don't see this as a one and the other. I just see them completely together. That's very encouraging to hear um, from many of us, I'm sure. Uh, one question, since I know we probably have a lot of wine drinkers in our audience, um, is there one thing that you would encourage our audience to kind of look out for when they're visiting a winery or buying wine to make sure that they're drinking more sustainably? Well, I, I think it's a good point because honestly, I think the, the, uh, the wines of tomorrow are gonna to be more um, adequately judged and more, uh, more judged in general by the values of the people that produce them uh, than how many points they garter by some wine critic or how fancy their package is. Uh, that said, there's a, you know, when it, marketing enters into the sustainability world, there's a, lots of potential for abuse. Um, and so you have to be a little careful, I suppose. But you know, now with so much uh, social uh, connectivity, um, I, I caution people who do greenwashing in the wine business to be very, very careful because the word will get out. So uh, you know, join your colleagues in discussion uh, uh, and. Uh, and go visit the wineries too. Uh, we've got a place to park in your, uh, to plug in your electric vehicle and we'd love to have you, no doubt. I love that. Okay, Jason, and we'll, we'll end it with you. Um, other than My Climate Journey, what is your favorite climate industry resource for our audience if you had to pick one? Uh, oh, well, I, I, I don't know if I could, uh, I don't know if I could pick one, but um, uh, th there's a newsletter called Heated that I enjoy. Uh, there's another one by David Roberts, who left Vox recently, who has a newsletter. I can't remember the name of it, but it's David Roberts, formerly of, of Vox. Uh, Bloomberg, uh, Akshat Rati does some good writing. Quartz uh, uh, does some good writing. Michael Corrin, uh, believe it or not, BuzzFeed uh, does some good writing as well. I wouldn't have thought of them as a climate publication until I had uh, their climate, one of their main climate reporters on the show. Uh, so there, and, and obviously, you know, books like Project Drawdown and uh, some good documentaries, there's, there's no shortage of resources. It just requires uh, people following their intellectual curiosity and getting going. Awesome. I hope someone was writing all of those down. Um, so on that note, we're going to conclude the first round of our sustainability snapshots. Uh, please take a quick moment for yourself and join us in a minute for our next session, an exploration of how climate change is transforming how we think about risk. 